Uh, as you know, in our upcoming conference, uh, which uh, will begin uh, next a week from this Thursday, uh, we'll be talking about being fishers of men and going out and reaching out to the lost and dying world of the gospel message. Because remember, it's not what goes on in this life, but it's really all about the afterlife and our eternal life that we will spend with God forever and ever and ever, or not if we don't become believers here in this time. So it's very important for us and more important for us, especially with the news that I just gave you, to, you know, want to reach out to every heart and soul that is out there and give them the gospel message because, again, God doesn't want to lose one and you should not want to lose one either. And again, that's what our conference is going to be about, again, trying to bring as many people as possible to salvation according to the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So again, hopefully you can join us for that conference and, uh, uh, which will begin next Thursday evening. Again, a week from this coming Thursday. All right, so uh, as we continue on in uh, the book of Ephesians, let's turn to chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1 this morning. <clears throat> and as I said, this message is uh, going to uh, continue to uh, uh, encourage us. And again, with the news that I just gave to you about the passing of uh, someone close to us uh, or a family member or someone who is uh, close to us, Again, uh, we have to remember the power of God and the power of God that is demonstrated to us and that it was especially demonstrated through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we hear our continuing in verses 19 and 20, Paul's first great prayer for the church as he prays for the believers of the early church, but also for us today as it is now written for us and found in the completed canon of Scripture. And so we understand now the power that God has available for us. God wants to tell us about that power. He wants us to understand that power. He wants that power to be in our lives each and every day. And it's the same power that resurrected our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's the power that's available to you and I uh, in our everyday lives. So let's look at uh, this great prayer going back to verse 15. <clears throat> As we've already noted and exegeted uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, verses and found uh, fantastic principles and precepts, but in verse 15 it says, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints. Do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. So the thanksgiving prayer, the intercessory prayer of Paul on behalf of these people. Then in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And there we understood the Gnosis doctrine, the Epinosis doctrine, and especially that Oida doctrine. Again, Oida knowledge, that Greek word Oida that means that you absolutely know. You possess the knowledge. You have this resonant within your soul. It is now a part of you, and you walk with it each and every day. He says in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know. Again, that's that word Oida. You may know, absolutely, no doubt in your mind, you possess this knowledge. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And again, the riches that we have, the glory that is God, that is, that is God's, that will be given to us and that has already been given to us. Also signified by that great inheritance that is waiting for us, that is founded in Jesus Christ that we noted in verses 13 and 14. And then it goes on in verse 19, and here's where we pick it up today. It says, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? Again, the unbeliever does not have this power available to them other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we have this power available to us 24 by 7 each and every day. We have the greatness of God waiting for us and at our beckoning call that can be in our life and that is in our lives. Again, in verse 19, And what is the surpassing greatness of His power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might, which we, He brought about in Him. Again, he brought about this power, this strength, this might, this working. He brought about that in Christ Jesus. It says, in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And so what we have there in verse 20, which we'll get to in just a minute as we go through some of what verse 19 has for us. But again, we have the manifestation. We have the demonstration of the power of God that is available to us. And the power of God is so powerful. 
powerful that it can take a dead, inanimate object and bring it to life. And that's what God can do. Even though that body of Jesus Christ laid in the grave for three days and three nights, totally dead and, again, uh, starting that uh, again decay process, as we would say as well. But ultimately, that dead, inanimate body, God is able to bring that back to life. And he demonstrated his power through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if God can do that... What can He do for you in your life? What strength and power is available to you? What can He give you each and every day? Not only through His Word and the indwelling and filling of God the Holy Spirit, but in the answering of your prayers as well to help you overcome the problems, the difficulties, and the details of life. The heartaches, the pains... All of the things that do hit us each and every day within our lives. If God can raise a dead, inanimate body and bring it back to life, then how? Uh, then what can He not do for you in your everyday life? And see, that's what we have to know. That's why Paul says, I want your eyes to be enlightened. In other words, I want you to wake up to this fact. I want the light of God's Word and the knowledge of His strength and power to be in you so that you absolutely know it. And remember, we talked about Gnosis Doctrine, which is just data, the words on the page that get transferred into Epinosis Doctrine. Again, the other Greek word that talks about full knowledge, but more importantly, it talks about your interacting with it. And that's truly what Epinosis Doctrine means. It means that you are now interacting with the Word of God. You're an active participant in the knowledge of who and God, uh, what God is. And as we see in this verse, then it takes it to the third stage of oida knowledge, which is that knowledge that you possess. That possessed knowledge, which means it's in your soul, it's in your memory banks, and it's part of your daily thinking. You see, this is what God desires for you and I, that we know His power, and that not only that we know His power, we all can stand back and say, ooh, God's all-powerful, look at the creation, look at the stellar universe. We recognize the power of God around us, but do you recognize it in your own life? And that's what it's really all about. And that's what God wants you to know. That that power to create the heavens and the earth, to take from nothing and to bring into existence the entire stellar universe, to take from the dust of the ground that he created to form a body called Adam, and then to give it life soul life, spiritual life, and physical life. That's the power that God has. To take the dead body of Jesus Christ after it was uh, you know, uh, whipped, beaten, and tortured, and then ultimately he gave up his life upon that cross, allow it to be in a tomb for three days and three nights, spirit and soul removed, but able to bring a spirit and soul back into that body and reanimate that body, repurify that body, fix that body, reconstitute the molecular structure of that body, and then have it even more more so to be a resurrection body that can walk through walls and trans, uh, trans, uh, uh, transgend or, or transpose through time and space. You see, that's what God can do. And if He can do that, if He can do that greater, then He can absolutely do the lesser with anything that we have uh, going on within our lives. There is power and there is strength. I want your eyes to be enlightened. I want this knowledge of God to be revealed to you. And again, that revelation, which really talks about the manifestation, what God is showing you. And again, He showed us all through the resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. So there have been a number of things that Paul has prayed for here in this prayer. Back in verse 17, a spirit of wisdom, revelation in the knowledge of Him. Again, that we understand these things, our eyes be enlightened. In verse 18, again, the enlightening of our eyes, having that oida knowledge, that possessed knowledge. And then we also have understanding the riches of His glory that is found in the inheritance that is waiting for us. That's another aspect of the knowledge giving us what? Confidence to go forward in our everyday life. Confidence knowing that whether we live or die, there's something waiting for us in the eternal state. And not just something, but something fantastic, something wonderful, and something absolutely incredible. The inheritance that is Jesus Christ is waiting for us. And what is the inheritance waiting for Jesus Christ? That all rule and authority and power will be given to Him. You see, the Father is going to bequeath that to His Son, Jesus Christ. And all rule, authority, and power is going to be given to Christ. And oh, by the way, that's what's going to be given to us as well, because we will be His wife, and we are His body that will continue forever and ever and ever. 
That's the greatness that waits for us. Not just that there's something over there, and as I joked on Tuesday or Thursday night, just sitting on the clouds playing your little harp for the rest of eternity, okay? No, there's going to be power, rule, authority, riches, wealth, all kinds of things, everything you need. A body that will never die, never get tired, never wear out, will never be sick, will, uh, and, and, uh, you know, will never get hungry, will never have any needs, wants, uh, and, and, and therefore not creating any desires within your soul whatsoever, because you will have it all. And that's what comes with the believer. And that's what comes because of our inheritance, and that's because of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. And that's what Paul wants us to know. So he's given us these five things thus far, and now the sixth thing that he gives us here in this verse is the knowledge of that. He wants us to know these things, possess that knowledge, which means you walk with it every day. It's not that you just hear it and you think about the power of God that's around you in the, in the universe and think that it's, you know, existential to who you are, but he wants you to know this is me. This is part of what I have and who I am. And this power that is God is available to me. And I love these two words that he uh, gives to us to emphasize this and, you know, call this the double emphasis, but he calls it the surpassing greatness. The surpassing greatness. We have two Greek words there, hupabalo and then megathos. And again, if any of you, uh, you know, know anything about the Transformers and the current movies and Megatron and all this, okay, I just think of megathos, okay? The greatness of God. Uh, Hooper, a balo, a balo, ultimately is a compound word made up of hooper, which is a preposition, which means above and beyond. It means superior to all things. And then that Greek word balo means to cast or to throw. So again, you combine those two things, and, and the word surpassing is a good one, but again, beyond what you can throw, beyond what you can cast. In other words, hurling accolades, hurling uh, credit, hurling uh, the uh, abilities and powers of God beyond what you can think or imagine. And that's why this uh, phrase is also uh, in comparison to what we have in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that says God can do beyond all that we can imagine, all that you can think and all that you can imagine. And we call that the life beyond dreams. God can do that. And that's the power of God that's available within your life. And then this word megathos, again, that greatness of who he is. Mega or megas is the Greek word, the root word there that just means great. But you put the thos on the end, the greatness, the absolute greatness. The power, the greatness, the resources, the availability, surpassing greatness. It's one thing to be greatness, but then to go beyond greatness. And what is beyond greatness? (laughs) <laughs> what is beyond greatness? But there is, again, and it really emphasizes the infinite nature of who and what God is, his power, his strength, his sovereignty, his love, his righteousness, his just, everything that who and what he is and what he has available for you. Beyond all that you can ask or think. And we'll see that when we get to Ephesians 3.20 in just a minute. But these two words are used to describe in this passage the power of God. And here we have actually four Greek words, and then there's a fifth one that comes in in verse 21 that Paul uses, or God uses, to describe his own power. You see, there are five Greek words that God needed to use to tell us about the power that is available to us, the power that he has and the power that is available to us. And the main word that we have here is dunamis. Now, when we talk about the essence of God, we talk about the omnipotence of God, and we say that's all-powerful. Well, the Greek word for that is this generic word dunamis, which talks about the power of God. And ultimately, I'm going to give you some definition of each of these words, because when we talk about dunamis, it talks about inherent ability. It's really about what he has and what he can do. Again, he doesn't have to gain these things. He doesn't have to acquire these things. He doesn't uh, make them better over time or greater or more over time. It's not like when you plug in your computer or your, your phone or uh, you know, your laptop or whatever. You know, the battery runs out of uh, energy and you've got to plug it in so it builds up more, 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 more. No. Again, God is the energizer bunny, as we would say, to make it in a cute, funny way. But ultimately, he never runs out of power. 
And the power that he has is the power that he has. And that power is available to us each and every day. And it's inherent to who he is, his ability, strength, power. Again, it can be translated in all these different ways. But when we look at the four or five different Greek words, each of them speak of something particular about who and what God is. And really gets us to that word, omnipotence. Because when we talk about all-powerful, there are many different aspects to what strength, power, might, uh, and ability can speak to. And so God gives us all of those so that we can understand who and what he is. But ultimately, it's his essence. He is the all-powerful one. So the desire of Paul here is that we oida this information. Again, we absolutely, dogmatically, without uh, quivering or without doubting, okay? Oh, I should say wavering. (laughs) Without wavering. Again, we know this information. And it's there within our soul. You see, unfortunately, there's too many believers who are doubting. Again, the doubting Thomases of our generation. And they doubt this, they doubt that. And they're not sure if God can do this. They're not sure if God can do that. But the fact of the matter is, God can. And God does. And we should never doubt. Now, the will of God always comes into play. Again, as Jesus Christ prayed in the Garden of Eden, Father, if there's a way, make this plan of salvation happen without me having to go to the cross. But then he said, but not my will, but your will be done. You see, God had the power to do it a different way. But the way that he found to do it was in his son, Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrificial lamb that we're going to commemorate at the end as we take our communion. You see, God had the power to save us all. But the will of God, with His righteousness and justice working in conjunction with His sovereignty and His power, said, no, this is how it's going to be done. And Jesus recognized that. Not my will, but your will be done. The power of God is there. The power of God is there to help in time of need. The power of God is is there in all aspects, regardless of the situation that we're facing in time. And the three other Greek words that we have in this passage explain the omnipotence of God. They explain the all-encompassing aspect of His power that is available to us. And the first word is that He is working. He's working, working, working. And work is actually a power word. It means what you're doing, the action, the exertion of the power and strength. And the fact of the matter is that God is working in a gear, is the Greek word there. He's got the energy to do whatever needs to be done. And he's, and he's applying that energy on a consistent basis. So we talk about the operative power of God. In other words, God never takes a day off. He is always there working for you 24 by 7. So never think that God's not there or God's not available. You should never have that thought in your process, or God's too busy. Again, that's another aspect that you hear, uh, you know, through Christianity sometime. And, you know, when people truly don't understand God, oh, God's, you know, he's too worried about what's going on in the countries and, uh, and, and, and the leaders of our nation. He's too busy, you know, with them to worry about me. So I don't ask him to do things for me. You know, and then they have this false sense of humility or a reason why, you know, things don't happen in their life. But as the Word of God says, you don't receive because what? You have not asked. You see, God just wants you to ask. And His power, His ability, His resources will be there for you because He is working for you 24 by 7. You are indwelt with the Holy Spirit from the day of your salvation. He is working in you 24 by 7. He's trying to work and work and work and uh, lead you to more and more righteousness, more and more understanding of your relationship with God. And Jesus Christ, again, is there at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you each and every day. As Satan comes and accuses you, oh, why you saved that Christian? Look at the sin in their life. Jesus is there saying, because they're justified. When you offer up your prayers, not only does the Holy Spirit offer it to you, Romans chapter 8, but Jesus Christ is there as well interceding for you and saying, hey, Dad, can you help these people out? Hey, Dad, can you do this? Hey, Dad, can you do that? He's there for them. They never stop working for us, all three members of the Trinity. So never think you're alone. Never think that you can't tap into the power and the resource of God. It's always there. And oh, by the way, the Word of God, when you possess it in your soul, it's always there. 
You see, if you have the Word of God in your memory banks and it's stored there, it's always there for you to think about and to apply. It's always there. The operative power of God. Again, energia. Then we have this word strength. And again, kratos is the Greek word there. And it talks about strength, power, might, but it also dominion or authority. And it really talks about the manifested strength of God that is available to us. And again, we could say this is also the outworking, the demonstration of His power. And it also has in regard, again, all of these are somewhat synonymous in one way, but they all have their little shade, their little shade to give us you know, another aspect of who and what God is. And so they all do line up with the sovereignty of God, but, and especially this one because it talks about His dominion and authority, His rule. We read in the Bible that there are realms out there. There are realms out there. In the angelic realm, as we call it, okay? There are kingdoms out there that we have no idea of what they are. And we're going to see in the upcoming verses, uh, well, let's just uh, jump down to verse uh, 21, which is very much like uh, chapter 6, where it talks about picking up and putting on the full armor of God. In verse 21, it says, Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So right now, there are powers, rules, uh, dominions, authorities, realms. And in other scriptures, it tells us they existed before. And Satan was uh, somewhat of a, a, a ruler and leader of those realms prior to the creation of mankind. And then as Paul says, in this age, which isn't talking dispensations, it's talking about the age of man, and then in the one to come. After this world is done, after the millennial reign, going on into the eternal state. And God is far above them all. All His created beings. Again, all the angels, all of mankind, all the uh, dominions that are out there. And then we have this word might. And that word is the word iskus. And we see that being strength, power, might, or forcefulness. And this talks about the power as an endowment or the possession of power. And again, it's the power that he has, the power that he possesses. And again, similar to dunamis with that inherent power, but the might, the mighty one. And again, when you think of the mighty one, okay, usually you're thinking of somebody that is already accomplished. And they've already demonstrated their power and their strength. And you see the results of that, and you say, oh, that's a mighty person. That's the mighty one. That's a mighty king. That's a mighty ruler. That's a mighty empire. That's a mighty nation. And so again, God has that power. Again, the endowment of that power, the accolade of of His power and strength that has been given to us. So when we look at these things, again, we have dunamis, we have energia, we have kratos, we have iskis. And we see this also uh, when we talk in Ephesians chapter 6.10, when we get there uh, in a few months from now as we continue to study this book. Ultimately, in Ephesians chapter 6.10, God's power is lauded at that point in time. His might, His strength. Uh, He's the mighty one because He is the dunamis one. He is the all-powerful one. And that's who God is. And that power that is God is available to you. And it's available to me, and it's available to all, as Paul says, all those who believe. We who believe, we have this. And as I said, the fifth aspect of the power of God is His authority. And again, exousia. And we see that word, and it's alluded to here, as He's above all rule and authority. And this exousia talks about the power, the authority to be able to do things, the freedom to be able to do things. You see, God is free to do, and there's no one stopping him from doing what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, and how he wants to do it, other than himself, as we talk about his righteousness, his justice, his integrity, his love. That's the only thing that manages who and what God can do. But when all his essence line up, in essence, when we talk about the sovereignty of God, he is the ultimate authority and can do whatever he wants to do. He is the ultimate sovereign one. And that's another form of power that God has. You see, as the sovereign one, he can make any decision for you in your life that he wants to make. He can let you go left, he can let you go right. 
If you want to go right, he can try to turn you to make you go left, as he did with Balaam. And you know the story of Balaam and his, his donkey. And we see the power of God working within our lives in all five aspects. So in dunamis, we have the inherent ability of God. In in Agia, we have the operative power of God. In Kratos, we have the manifested power of God. In Iskos, we have the possession of the power to overcome. And then when we have our final word here, exousia, we have power, authority, freedom to do a thing. And all of these speak of the authority and power, the sovereignty that God has in regard to His omnipotence. And this is what's available to you and I. And God you know, uh, it knew that just by having this and say, hey, guess what, folks? I'm the all-powerful one. I'm the almighty one. Just by God saying that, He knew that people would never come to that realization of who and what He was. You see, saying it alone doesn't get you there. So God did what? Demonstrated His power, manifested that power. And again, He did that all throughout the Old Testament as we read about the various aspects of God's power, starting with creation, coming all the way through the manifestations of Christ and working with Israel and the power that God demonstrated to those people in the Exodus, post-Exodus, coming into the nation, defeating of armies. We see the power of God time and time again. But the great manifestation of God's power was founded in no other person than it should have been founded in, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And through Christ, he demonstrated that power, especially when he resurrected him from the dead. Again, the power was demonstrated to us throughout his entire walk as Jesus Christ was sustained by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Even upon the cross, when any uh, any uh, any I don't even want to say normal member of the human race, even though that's what I just said, but any member of the human race would have cracked under the weight and pressure that Jesus Christ endured upon the cross. And they would have sinned. But yet Jesus Christ never cracked because he did what? Trusted in the power of God. And you see, as you go through life, as you walk each and every day, regardless of the temptation, regardless of what this world is throwing at you, regardless of Satan and his cosmic system. Again, you have power so that you will not crack. But when you don't tap into that power, that's when you crack. And that's when we fall into sin. We start to fear, worry, anxiety, whatever the case may be. We lose our hope, we lose our confidence, and again, we trip and stumble. But when we hang on to the power of God, regardless of the situations in life, again, we continue to go forward. God continues to fill our hearts with joy and happiness and peace. And we have the strength to overcome whatever this life throws at us. So the manifestation, again, let's read verse 20 uh, real quick, where it says, which he brought about in him. In Jesus Christ, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So here we have the great working of God's power and his omnipotence in Christ in these two ways. Raising him from the dead. It's funny, he could have just stopped there. You know, Paul could have stopped writing right there, but the Holy Spirit inspired him. You know, go beyond that. Go beyond raising from the dead. Because not only was the manifestation of God's power in reanimating the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and putting the spirit and soul back into it to give it life, but he also then seated him at his right hand. He took the humanity of Jesus Christ and said, you know, this is the ultimate seat of authority that I'm sitting on. Here, sit right beside me. And so what we see is the, is the delegation of the authority and power of God given to the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as God, Jesus Christ always had that. You know that. But in his humanity, he now has it. In that resurrected body, he now has that. And so not only was the power of God demonstrated to us by bringing someone back to life, but then by delegating that authority to another, a fellow member of the human race, who now also wields that power 
And as you know, comparing Scripture with Scripture, going back to Romans 8, 32, 33, Jesus Christ intercedes for us on a consistent basis. He uses the delegated power that was demonstrated to us through the raising of that body back to life, seating Him at the right hand of the Father. He uses that power on our behalf. So not only does the Father have the power, but that Jesus Christ, the Son in humanity, has the power. And that power is directed towards you and I. And we need to recognize that and understand that each and every day. And so this is the resurrection and the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And those are two separate doctrines. And this, this week, uh, you know, Tuesday and Thursday night, we're going to talk about these things, the resurrection and accession of Christ even more so, and understand uh, the detail and the power behind it. But the resurrection of Christ and the session of Christ, being seated at the right hand of God. And we've already talked about Operation Footstool for Jesus, where all authority is placed under His feet. That begins at the millennial reign and will continue for all of eternity. But just to give you some quick definition, because we do want to get to our communion service this morning, basically, resurrection is the rising again from the dead. It's different from resuscitation. And in the Bible, we see many people who were resuscitated. Paul resuscitated a young man who fell asleep during Bible study and fell out a window and died when he hit the ground. God brought him back to life. But that was resuscitation because that individual unfortunately, had to suffer physical death again. And we see other individuals, Lazarus and Elijah, uh, 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 yeah, Elijah, raising people from the dead. I was going to say, uh, no, Elisha, sorry, Elisha, rising people from the dead. Okay? But those individuals had to go through physical death once again. But the first resurrection of all time was the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because resurrection means that they will never, ever, ever suffer death again. And that's the resurrection that we all have promised for us. And that's the resurrection that our loved ones who have gone before us, who have already died, will also receive based on their faith in Jesus Christ. We will all be raised to eternal glory, never to die again. That's what resurrection is. Resuscitation, bringing back to life, but suffering death again. Resurrection, never having to suffer that death again. Let's go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. And let's just read about that real quick. Just go back a couple of pages from Ephesians. After the book of Romans, chapter 15. We'll start in verse 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and uh, verse 1, it says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, again, that gospel, unless you believed in, in vain. It says, for I delivered to you as of first importance. And I love how he uses that with the chapter 12 with the communion as well. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He also was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, being Peter, then to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Most of them remain until now. But some have fallen asleep. Some have already died. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. Again, James, Jesus' half-brother. Then to all the apostles. And last of all, it was uh, as it were. To one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles uh, who am not fit to be called the apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so we believe, or so you believe. It says, now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. 
Moreover, we are even found to be fault, uh, false witnesses of God, because we witnessed against God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. Again, He's, uh, you know, uh, uh, being uh, hypothetic there. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. And let me just pause there because that's what we're going to focus on in the communion. Because, you know, the resurrection, the demonstration of the power of God would not be possible if first the death of Jesus Christ, the payment of the penalty of our sins upon the cross did not happen first. So again, resurrection is part of the gospel. Again, the hope of what the cross did for us. And again, as it says, you are still in your sins. If there's no resurrection, there was no cross then. And none of us are saved. Verse 18, it says, Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hope in, or help, hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Again, what a waste of time. But again, as, as you know and as we've talked about before, these men gave their lives on behalf of Jesus Christ. These 500 that saw him gave their lives on behalf of Jesus Christ. And they went out and preached him. And so again, if it was a falsehood or a lie, you know, why would they go to such extremes and actually give their lives on behalf of Jesus Christ? You see, the giving of your life means that you have absolute confidence in what he has done. And now you're going to go to your grave believing in what you have believed. So then in verse 20 it says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, and after those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom to God and to the God and Father when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. And really talk about the angelic realm. All right, so let's sit, skip all the way over to uh, verse 51. And again, in between, you can read uh, that on your own and understand uh, more of what the resurrection body is all about, especially in verse 35. But in verse 51, it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, again die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable, this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, this mortal will have put on the immortality, then will come about the saying. That is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So as we have in Ephesians chapter 1, knowing the power, the strength, the ability, uh, the, the, the capability, and the ever-working God that is there for us each and every day. Again, you should have strength and confidence to go forward in your life each and every day to overcome whatever may be tempting and testing you in this life. And so as we recognize the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the promise of our own resurrection and that resurrection due to the power of God, as Paul says, know that power. As he says in verse 58, Therefore be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Power to overcome. And when we know it, we will live it. But if we don't know it, we're not going to live it. We're going to have fear, worry, and doubt. But when you know it, you're going to live it, and you're going to uh, be uh, walking in it, and you're not going to have that fear, worry, anxiety. Oh, what's going to happen tomorrow? Oh, what's going to happen the next day? Oh, I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. And you're going to have power to overcome whatever temptations this world or your sin nature can throw at you. All right, so uh, let's uh, pause there now as we uh, continue to uh, focus on uh, our communion supper that we're about to partake of.
And so uh, let's just close uh, this portion right now in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your power, your strength that is available to us. And Father, not only do we call your power for us uh, right now and uh, going forward in our own lives, but we pray for the Pearson family and that you give them power and strength and uh, show them the hope of resurrection for uh, Amy and the entire family and allow them to know the power of your Son, Jesus Christ, and of your power that's available to us. So Father, we pray for these things as we now celebrate the victory of the cross. In Christ's name, amen. All right, Father, we thank you uh, for this time, and now uh, let's uh, thank you for this time as well. And uh, now we'll prepare to take our, off, uh, our communion. So if I could have uh, the ushers come forward, and we'll pass out our communion elements. Are you going to sing you have a song? Yeah, let me sing the song. All right, let's just uh, pray for this portion of our service as we celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, we just uh, thank you for this time to celebrate the victory of your Son, uh, Jesus Christ, on the cross, the victory that was won by your great plan and also your sustaining power. We ask that uh, you uh, lead us to uh, focus and concentrate on uh, the message of the communion and also the message that uh, we're going to hear in the song right now that uh, tells us about our great relationship with you and the love that you have for us. So, Father, we thank you for this time of celebration. In Christ's name, amen.
Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and he's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and he's coming back. He's coming back. Just think. <laughs> Let's not say a thing for a minute. As I said, uh, you know, during the service, uh, that uh, you know there would be no resurrection without the cross, and so when we take communion, we. Focus on the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because that's where it all began and that's where the work was uh, really done and demonstrated for us in the power of the forgiveness of our sins. Again, the sin which had death and uh, it holds death over each and every one of us, brought death into this world, uh, ultimately is now abolished through the work of Jesus Christ. So not only did God uh, be able to raise a dead body back to life, but for those of us who were dead spiritually, he also gives us spiritual life through the work of Jesus Christ. He abolished sin and the penalty and payment that comes with it. And so that's why we gather together to celebrate on an uh, occasional basis to remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what He did for us at the cross, that He died for our sins, taking on the sins not only of the believer but the entire world, paying the penalty for them so that we would not have to. And as God said, as long as we believe. As long as we believe, we then receive the forgiveness of our sins, and ultimately we also will be recipients of that great resurrection at the second advent or second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So as our Lord said in that upper room discourse, and as Paul uh, reminded us as well, as Paul received you know, that which the Lord delivered to him, again, Jesus Christ took bread and broke it and said, this is my body uh, which is given for you. Receive this in thanksgiving. And so in thanksgiving we receive the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in remembrance of him. And then in the same way, he also took the cup on that night and said, this is the blood of my new covenant. Again, the new covenant that I have with you. Now that the death has occurred upon the cross, ultimately the life insurance contract can be fulfilled. That's what this new covenant is all about. The life insurance contract can be fulfilled. That means that now the life that was in Christ can now be given to us. And you and I now have eternal life in Christ because of what he did for us on the cross. And all those who believe receive that as well. So again, this is the cup of uh, the new covenant in my blood. Drink this as often as you meet in remembrance of me. In remembrance of our Lord, let us drink the blood. And as Paul reminded us, as often as we do this, we bring the remembrance and thanksgiving of our Lord into our uh, own thought process. So, Father, let's just bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time of uh, thanksgiving, this time of praise, worship, and glory. We can't thank you enough, Father, for what you have done for us personally, individually, and collectively. And Father, we thank you for your Son and his great work upon the cross and also your Spirit that has made sure that all of this has uh, been uh, made possible for us and has sealed us now for our own day of redemption and for our eternal inheritance. So, Father, we thank you for all that you have done in your Son, Jesus Christ, as well. Amen. All right, thank you very much uh, for the communion service. You can pass your cups uh, to the aisle, and uh, they'll be collected. And as we uh, conclude uh, our service... Uh,
This morning we will take an offering and then we'll close with a couple of songs. So uh, now is our time uh, where we uh, uh, take of an offering uh, to meet the needs of our local assembly so that we can continue to go forward and uh, glorify God by delivering the gospel far and wide. So uh, let's just pray for our offering right now. Father, we thank you for this time of giving. And we give to you the first of all that you have given to us, again, first and foremost, and thanking you for all the blessings, especially in this country, of the material things that you have given to us. We offer the first of those back to you, to your glory, to meet your needs here within this local assembly. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Barry could pass the offering.